Good evening, everybody. Um, if, if you find our friends next door sometimes make a bit of a noise, like we've just done, so if you find it's difficult to hear, I would fill up, just walk quietly up and fill up the front seats. Okay. I don't mean now, but if you find it's too difficult to concentrate. Um, I felt we gave them some opposition tonight. It's nice doing gong here, isn't it? Here. Yeah. And you really notice, the moment I came in and people were chanting Daimoku, I thought how much more friendly this hall seemed, doesn't it? Films, it fills it with a sort of warmth. So, tonight, as you can see from the diagrams, which uh, have been beautifully done, uh, we're going to do exactly the opposite of what I said we were going to do at the end of the last lecture. At the end of the last lecture, a month ago, I said that I probably thought that uh, this uh, chapter on the fivefold comparison, etc., might be too dry, in a way, for a lecture and that perhaps we ought to go on and do the final part of this pamphlet, number three, which is to do with the Soka Gakkai. But on thinking about it later, I really felt that it should be the other way round. Uh, really, the history of the Soka Gakkai is very straightforward, uh, and you can read that through and totally feel happy about it, I believe. But the five-fold comparison, uh, etc., is not really quite so straightforward. So I felt in a way I'd be chickening out unless I had a go to try and help uh, everybody to really understand it. So the first point I'd like to make tonight is that uh, this lecture that I'm going to give is really concerned with Nichiren Shoshu doctrine. And this study manual, quite naturally, since it's meant for followers of Nichiren Shoshu Buddhism is looking at these doctrines from the religious, the religious aspect. It's not in any sense looking at this doctrine from an academic sense. So if by any chance there are any guests here uh, who prefer to view things academically, at any rate uh, in their first approach to Buddhism, uh, I really hope they'll contact their friend afterwards and we'll have to, to uh, perhaps talk individually uh, to them. Maybe they could come to the Richmond Center and we can explain. But this is very much from the religious aspect. In other words, I'm not going to be quoting uh, many, many sutras and references and so on. So I hope you understand that, any guests who are here tonight. So we're going to tackle, first, first of all, uh, the five-fold comparison. And this is a system of thinking or an approach in order to prove conclusively the validity of Nichiren Daishonin's teachings. And it's on this diagram over here, the five-fold comparison. In other words, it's five stages of examination or comparison, the whole purpose of which is to lead step by step to the conclusion that nam myoho renge kyo is the ultimate essential law of life. This is what its whole purpose is. And Nichiren Daishonin expounded this in uh, the Gosho called The Opening of the Eyes, Kaimoku Show. So I really think it's probably best for you to just sit back and listen. Don't worry about this book. And I hope that uh, having gone through it like this, uh, in I hope a reasonably relaxed way, uh, then if sometime you'd like to read through the text itself, it'll be that much more meaningful to you. Anyway, that's what I'm aiming for tonight. So as you see, there are five stages, and they're very clearly uh, written up over here. Stage one is to compare Buddhism in general with non-Buddhism in general. Stage two is to compare Mahayana with Hinayana Buddhism. Stage three is to 
compare what we know as the true teachings, which is the Lotus Sutra, with the provisional teachings that went before the Lotus Sutra. Stage four concerns the Lotus Sutra itself, the comparison of what are known as the theor theoretical teachings, the first part of the sutra, with the final part of the sutra known as the essential teaching. And finally, the comparison of the Buddhism of the sowing, which was Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism, with the Buddhism of the harvest, which was Shakyamuni's Buddhism. As you can see, numbers three, four, and five also comprise another approach which is called the threefold secret teachings. <clears throat> but we'll come to those briefly a little later on. The first thing is to really master this method of approach to prove the essence of Nichiren Daishonin's teachings. In other words, nam myoho renge kyo of the three great secret laws. So, uh, in the opening of the eyes, Nichiren Daishonin said as follows, of all Shakyamuni's lifetime teachings, the true doctrine of Ichinen Sanzen, or the mystic law, the seed of Buddhahood for the common people since time without beginning, lies only in the Lotus Sutra. Of the entire Lotus Sutra, it is only in the Juryo chapter of the essential teaching. Of the latter, it is only hidden in the depths. Hence, Ichinen Sanzen hidden in the depths. So even there, in a brief sort of summary, Nichiren Daishonin is talking about these five comparisons. So I think that it, although it may seem to be starting the wrong way round, I would just like to say something about two points before we get into the actual uh, five-fold comparison itself. The first one contains its ultimate or last uh, stage, which is the comparison of the Buddhism of the sowing and the Buddhism of the harvest. The Buddhism of Shakyamuni is known as the Buddhism of the harvest because those who attain Buddhahood through his teachings and specifically through the Lotus Sutra which he taught in his last eight years, had approached enlightenment in a very, very gradual way over many, 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 many lifetimes. Shakyamuni himself made that clear later when he said that he also had been taught and had practiced bodhisattva austerities. So it was a question of elevating the state of your life, lifetime after lifetime, over eons. Sometimes people slip back and had to start again, rather like snakes and ladders. There are many uh, references to this in the teachings of Shakyamuni. For example, he's often quoting how in this lifetime and that lifetime this and that happened to him. In the stories which he described his various teachings with, he refers constantly to practice in previous lives in the form of bodhisattva austerities. So these were the steps which these followers took over eons. So in other words, the seed of Buddhahood was sown in the disciples of Shakyamuni, the followers of Shakyamuni, eons and eons before. And this seed then had to mature and grow and develop until finally it could be harvested. And Shakyamuni himself, as their master or teacher, appeared again in that lifetime in order to reap the harvest. So this, of course, is totally different from the Buddhism of the sowing. The Buddhism of the saying, Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism, carries out all the stages of sowing the seed, maturing, growing, maturing and developing it, and reaping the harvest 
in one lifetime. And it is this which Shakyamuni referred to as being essential to the age of Mapo in which we live. The age of Mapo when the people are filled with the three poisons. So in other words, uh, the bodhisattvas of the earth, us, and the people who live in this age of Mapo, which we live in now, we have not made all those causes, lifetime after lifetime, in the same way as Shakyamuni Buddha's disciples have. There's a reason for this. If we were elevated people with a saintly appearance, an unbelievable wisdom, such as many of the disciples of Shakyamuni were, people of great intellect, people of princely families, learned, reverend monks and so on, we could never possibly relate to the ordinary people in this age of Mapa. And the point is that it is the mass of the ordinary people in the age of Mapa who, as Shakyamuni predicted, would have to face such trying, difficult and unhappy conditions at this stage of the world's development that would need every single one of them the seed of nam myoho renge or the seed of Buddhahood to be sown in them. Because we also are born with the three poisons in us, wading about in the mud and slime of this old world, people can relate to us without any difficulty, and we can relate to them. And those people, feeling a relationship with us, will then listen to what we say and begin to practice in exactly the same way that we began to practice when we were approached by somebody. So in other words, the bodhisattvas of the earth draw each other out of the mud and slush of this world. And through drawing each other out, they generate the life force to keep this world happy. So our good fortune, or karma, whichever way you like to look at it, is that we, bodhisattvas of the earth, promised to do this. We undertook, in the time of Kuan Ganjo, in the time without beginning, to fulfill this role in the universe in all those planets in which human life or its equivalent exists. We said okay, despite the fact that we would have a heavy karma and be filled with the three poisons ourselves, we'll do it. And together with our master, Nichiren Daishonin, we will always be ready to prove the power of the Gohonzon in order to create a better, more vibrant world. So I hope that explanation helps you to understand the difference between the two approaches. So the Bodhisattvas of the earth, as you know, in the ceremony of the air, appeared out of the earth of this world, the earth of the human revolution. And it was to them that Chakamuni pointed and said, these people are the ones who will have to spread the true teaching in the age of Mapo. And he turned to his disciples and said, Sorry, chums, you're not equipped or capable of doing that job. It'll need people of a tougher sort. And there they are, the bodhisattvas of the earth. So I think it's important to understand that from the very beginning so that you can feel your way as we go through these comparisons. And the other thing I think it we want to be quite clear on is Ichinen Sanzen. I'll just read that passage from the Gosho again. Of all Shakyamuni's lifetime teachings, the true doctrine of Ichinen Sanzen, or the mystic law, the seed of Buddhahood for the common people since time without beginning, lies only in the Lotus Sutra, 
of the entire Lotus Sutra, it is only the Jurio chapter of the essential teaching. It is only, sorry, in the Jurio chapter of the essential teaching. Of the latter, it is only hidden in the depths. Hence, Ichin in Sanzen, hidden in the depths. <coughs> so we understand, most of us, because we practice Namyo Horenge Kyo, we understand, or we try hard to understand, the three great secret laws, and we had some lectures about it. But Ichin in Sanzen may be difficult for us to understand. Why is the mystic law also called Ichin in Sanzen? I haven't got time tonight to do the whole theory of Ichin in Sanzen. But suffice it to say, I hope, Ichin in Sanzen, meaning 3,000 worlds in a moment of life, is the theoretical explanation of how it is that we can reveal Buddhahood in every aspect of our life if we choose to make the effort to do so in one single lifetime. In other words, it's the workings of life, how life expresses itself. And it is in this theory, as you know, I'm sure all of you, that the principle of what's called the mutual possession of the ten worlds is stated. That is to say that each of those ten worlds, which we know so well, from hell to Buddhahood, also contains all the other nine worlds. So even in the world of hell, there is Buddha. And even in the world of Buddha, there is hell. The importance of that, of course, is that Buddha is a, a human uh, being, a human quality nothing else but that it's not something that belongs to saints and great sages but a part an innate part of human life so in the theory of Ichin and Sanzen it explains how it is that despite all those other state uh, worlds or states of life it is possible for even a human being in the state of hell to transform, him, transform his life until it is founded on the state of Buddha. And furthermore, the theory of Ichin and Sanzen goes on to explain the ten factors, Nyoze So, Nyoze Sho, Nyoze Ta, Nyoze Riki, which are the means by which Buddhahood, and of course any of the other states, express themselves in our life and it goes one step further and explains that this expression of our life goes outwards and inwards into three realms the realm which is oneself the inner realm of oneself and the realm of society and the realm of the land or world in which we live the physical geographical land or world so in its turn Ichin in Sanzen is in fact propounding the incredibly important principle of Esho Funi the inseparability of man and his environment so all of the three great secret laws of nam myoho renge kyo are expressed in the theory of Ichin and Sanzen, which in turn is what is working in our own life. This is why the mystic law and Ichin and Sanzen are one. The mystic law is the law of life. And Ichin and Sanzen, 3,000 worlds in a moment of, his, of existence, is the theory which explains that law. I think we'll go on now uh, to talk about the fivefold comparison step or stage by stage.
first of all, as you can see, uh, Nichiren Daishonin compared Buddhism with non-Buddhism. To us these days, with our opportunities of schooling and education and reading and libraries and all the rest of it, it is comparatively easy for us to make that comparison. Indeed, probably, we made that comparison in a sort of way ourselves before we decided to practice Buddhism. But in Nichiren Daishonin's day, uh, books and schools were few and far between. And people had to rely on verbal teachings which explained things to them. So whereas this particular stage, the first stage, may not seem so vital to us now and in a way rather obvious, in those days it was something uh, incredibly important and vital for all to understand. So of course all types of religions and philosophies fall into the category of non-Buddhism. All types of thinking, all uh, ideologies backed by any form of philosophy. So as well as the obvious uh, non-Buddhist teachings or philosophies like Christianity or Islam, Judaism and so on, you could also include other isms like communism, fascism and the rest. So all these teachings, the more you examine them, and I guess that's why you're all here and why you're all practicing, have incredible holes and gaps, don't they? I guess most of us embraced Buddhism because we found it incredibly difficult to find any holes or gaps in the teaching. Maybe we read books first before we practiced, asked questions, discussed, we couldn't find these gaps and holes. This made us probably suspicious at first. It seemed too good to be true. But the fact is that the more we go on practicing, three years, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, we're still not finding the holes and gaps. Buddhism is an amazingly complete and rounded philosophy. So of course, all other philosophies look at the world and look at life and are uh, attempting to explain it in a comprehensive way. But in fact, and I hope that I don't sound arrogant in saying this, but the facts are that when you've practiced Buddhism and you know something about the Buddhist philosophy and you perhaps go back and look at another philosophy, the incompleteness of it becomes very apparent. It's only part of the story of life, isn't it? I think you all know the famous story about the three blind men and the elephant. They were, these blind men were asked to say what it was, this object that was standing near them, which is a huge great elephant. And one stroked the leg and felt it, and he said he thought it was a tree. And the other felt the elephant's ears and said he thought it was a huge great fan and I think the other one found the tail and said it seemed like a whip but of course all they were seeing was a part of the elephant wasn't it they couldn't see the whole creature in itself and the more one uh, goes on studying Buddhism and at the same time thinking back to other philosophies, philosophies one had learnt about or even reading them again the more you find that in fact it's only a part of life and life's problems that those philosophies are covering. I mean in a way some of them would be rather like uh, a foreigner coming to England on Easter bank holiday and going to South End and seeing 300 wild young men beating the place up and imagining that the whole of England was just like that. That was their first view of England. Maybe when we first started to read books of deep interest, philosophical books, 
we felt fantastic, you know. But in fact, it was only a part of it, just like South End is only, thank goodness, a small corner of England. Nice place as South End is. <coughs> so, we'll move on now uh, to the next stage, Mahayana versus Hinayana. Uh, Mahayana and Hinayana mean, respectively, greater vehicle and smaller or lesser vehicle. Yana means vehicle. Vehicle in the sense of something which carries you. Could be a boat, could be a cart with wheels. Now, Hinayana is the smaller vehicle which carries you forward to your ultimate goal, i.e. enlightenment. Mahayana is the greater vehicle with the same aim. So here, of course, we really dive into Shakyamuni Buddha's teachings of 3,000 or so years ago. And I think it's very difficult, Kazuo Fuji was saying this the other day at a lecture, to really understand what an incredible impact Shakyamuni's teachings had in his day and age. It's not at all easy for us to imagine this. Today, we have nam myoho renge -kyo. We're pretty sure, even after a year or two's practice, that this is really the essence. So, it's not easy to understand the incredible stir which Shakyamuni's, Shakyamuni's teachings caused in his lifetime. And this was one of the things which Shakyamuni worried about very much indeed. He was enlightened. He understood totally life and its essence. How on earth was he going to set about teaching it? This was his great problem. So he thought and thought, I'm sure, of this. And he decided, first of all, to create a great stir. We don't know, of course, whether he did that intentionally in order to attract the maximum amount of attention or whether, which is much more likely, he did it to sort of whet people's appetites. To sort of say, look, you won't understand a word of this but this is what you can understand if you follow what I'm going to teach. So his first teaching was very high indeed in the realm of uh, provisional Mahayana Buddhism. But then he went back to basics and began to teach what are now known as the Hinayana Sutras. Very fundamental, very simple, taking little bit by little bit of life and explaining it. For example, he propounded the ten worlds, but not as the ten worlds as we know it. He took each world, and he probably taught about that world over and over and over again, one of them only. And then, at some point, he started to talk about the next world, over and over and over again. Examples, explanations and so on and all the time he was concerned about how he was going to reach that ultimate teaching which he finally called the Lotus Sutra or Myoho Renge Kyo so actually every day in Gongyo you are remembering this struggle with Shakyamuni undertook. At the end of the Jigage chapter, the last few lines, the narrow bit, you all know it so well, Maiji sa senen igaryo shujo tokunyumujo do sokujo jubushin. We repeat it so many times each day, don't we? Five times in morning gongyo, three times in evening gongyo, eight times a day. And that means 
This is my constant thought. How can I cause all living beings to gain entry to the highest way and quickly attain Buddhahood? This is my constant thought. How can I cause all living beings to gain entry to the highest way and quickly attain Buddhahood? I remember Sensei saying whenever he recites those few lines, he feels so grateful to the Buddhas who have brought through their efforts Nam Myoho Renge Kyo and the Gohons and to us today. So of course, when we do Gongyo, and we recite those words, we're not only praising Shakyamuni. When Shakyamuni taught and said those words, nam myoho renge kyo of the three great secret laws was still a secret which only he held and which he knew would have to wait till the age of Mapo before people had the capacity to understand it. Of course, our gratitude especially goes out to Nichiren Daishonin who took the trouble, because of his concern about the suffering in this world, to really delve into all the sutras and finally draw out of the Lotus Sutra the teaching of Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. So it's good to remember that. And as you come to Soko Joju Bushin, thank the Buddhas in your heart for what they've done for you. So uh, Hinayana, as I said, uh, went back to basics, to a lot of precepts, a code of living in which Shakyamuni tried to elevate the lives of his followers. It was very difficult to practice the Hinayana teachings really correctly. Peasants in the fields were not intelligent enough. Merchants who had to keep their shops open and, and look after their sales and order their stock wouldn't have had the time to do it. There were 250 stages, precepts, for men and 550, I think it was, for women. I'm not commenting on that. <laughs> so really, the Hinayana teachings, so far as correct complete full practice was concerned was only possible for dedicated people who segregated themselves from the world in, such as monks to rich people who had the leisure time to study Buddhism to its very depths and to scholars of high intellect so in no sense is Hinayana Buddhism a Buddhism for the ordinary people Hinayana Buddhism, of course, exists to this day in Southeast Asia especially, in various other parts of the world. And still, they're following the strict Hinayana teachings. But still, it's only the monks and other followers or scholars who can truly practice Hinayana Buddhism. Other people can play with it or even sincerely try bits of it but they can't possibly carry out the whole practice if they're at the same time going to continue with their normal, normal daily life in this world so it was this fact that Hinayana was open to so few that led uh, the people especially those who were versed in Buddhism with great compassion for the ordinary suffering people to develop far more after Shakyamuni's death the teachings of what are known as provisional Mahayana the early teachings of the greater vehicle now after Shakyamuni's death more and more people began to follow the flow of the greater vehicle So, the Mahayana teachings are essentially based on practice for oneself and practice for others. 
they were essentially concerned with the suffering of ordinary people whereas Hinayana Buddhism was really concerned with the enlightenment of the elite or the few so in the days after Shakyamuni died Mahayana, uh, Mahayana Buddhism had many many great leaders you know their names you see them crop up from time to time in articles about Buddhism people like Vasubandhu Nagarjuna and so on these were the people whose concern was with the people and wished to follow those teachings which uh, incorporated that concern So Hinayana Buddhism basically is concerned with eliminating one's desires. Many other religions have had such thoughts and ideas. Desires are always the problem, therefore there must be a way to get rid of them altogether. And this is what developed out of those earlier teachings of Shakyamuni who was in fact trying to teach people just to control their desires. But gradually over hundreds and hundreds of years this developed into the idea of removing your desires altogether. Of course today in the light of what Nichiren Daishonin taught we know this is absolutely impossible. Even in the Lotus Sutra, Shakyamuni himself did not continue to support such an idea. But still, due to perhaps human conservatism, lack of communication and so on, still, still there are human beings, you know, who are really struggling to rid themselves of their desires. So, Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism and indeed the Lotus Sutra teaches that desires are an inevitable part of life. Not only are they a part of life, but a very important part of life. Without desires, it would be very difficult to make this world tick, as it should do. Desires are the driving force of life. To deny them is self-destruction, self-annihilation. This is easy to understand now in the light of what we know but of course not easy to understand in those days. So people went on and on in their practices trying to rid themselves of desire and those who were not properly instructed would suffer incredibly from such a thing. So Mahayana Buddhism was totally counter to that. Mahayana Buddhism was aiming to elevate or rather develop the strong spirit which this thought understood existed in every human life. Its whole purpose was to elevate this and make ordinary people happy. So the two Hinayana and Mahayana were very very different concepts yet they arrived out of the same teacher. But I hope you understand the reason why Shakyamuni originally taught Hinayana in order to try to elevate the people, to get them to follow a better code of conduct and living. But unfortunately they became more and more distorted until uh, they were totally misunderstood and misused. So in the Lotus Sutra, when Shakyamuni taught it, there is a paragraph which says, if one exclusively teaches Hinayana teachings, but nothing from the Lotus Sutra, he will fall into the sin of begrudging to give. The sin of begrudging to give is the world of hunger. If one exclusively teaches Hinayana teachings, but nothing from the Lotus Sutra, 
you will fall into the sin of begrudging to give. In other words, the Lotus Sutra is very much concerned with giving, as are the, some of the other uh, provisional Mahayana Sutras. So Mahayana Buddhism was very much understood in Nichiren Daishonin's day. Japan was full of sects practicing provisional Mahayana. Therefore, uh, Nichiren Daishonin in the Gosho opening of the eyes does not go into this particular stage of the comparisons in any very great detail. And I think we can certainly leave it there and go on to the next one. So the next one, the third, is the comparison between the true teachings and the provisional teachings. The true teaching being the Lotus Sutra, the provisional teachings being all the sutras that went before it. So this, uh, uh, or rather, I'm sorry, I should say all the Mahayana teachings which went before it. So, the Lotus Sutra, as you all well know, was Shakyamuni's supreme teaching, and he clearly stated this at that time. The Lotus Sutra, which consists of uh, a prologue called the Muriyogi Sutra, or the Sutra of Infinite Meaning, and an epilogue called the Fugen Sutra, fathoming the wisdom of the Buddha Sutra. In between the epilogue and prologue, there's 28 chapters of Lotus Sutra. In the Muryogi Sutra, the Sutra of Infinite Meaning, or prologue, Shakyamuni proclaimed very clearly, in these more than 40 years, I have not yet revealed the truth. And later, in the main part of the Lotus Sutra, he said, honestly discarding the provisional teachings, I will expound the supreme law. So it's very, very clear, isn't it, that he was by that time teaching the picture of the whole elephant. Therefore he said to people, now take, up, take off your blindfold and you'll really see what that tail and ear and leg actually belongs to. Them. 